Assalamu alaikum everybody and a very warm welcome back to the podcast. You know, we took a couple of weeks break, as you guys know fully well. Uh, just in the month of Ramadan, um, sort of productivity just slowed down a little bit. But don't you worry, we are back with the Arabic with Sam podcast now. So, um, yeah, we'll be doing it every single week, inshallah, from, from now onwards. I might even chuck a couple of bonus episodes in there as well to catch up on the weeks that we didn't do throughout the month of Ramadan. But, um, yeah, but don't worry, we're back with a vengeance Episode 34 of the Arabic with Sam podcast, and today we're talking about party time, uh, because obviously end of Ramadan's been, we all had Eid al-Fitr, and um, yeah, so I thought we'd talk about party time, um, because there's lots of different celebrations that people celebrate in the Arab world, and um, yeah, and you know, and it's just worth talking about, right, and there's a little bit of kind of difference of opinion, um, um, even across the Arab world, like you'll, you'll see a lot of different celebrations that some Arabs celebrate and others others don't and stuff, and I thought that we'd just get into the language and the nitty-gritty of that, so, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about kind of the kinds of celebration first of all, and then maybe we'll go through a list of like 10, 15 really useful party words, you know, words that you'll hear in reference to celebrations and stuff like that, and I'll give some examples. And, um, yeah, and I suppose if I just kind of weave a little conversation with myself through all of that new vocabulary, then we'll end up with some cultural insights and stuff too, and hopefully that'll be very, very beneficial for you guys. So, so firstly, what are the celebrations, right? Like, obviously there are celebrations that we have here in the UK, and we have holidays because of them, like Easter, and, um, you know, we have Halloween and Christmas, obviously, but we're, our big ones are... Our big ones are obviously Christmas and Easter. But we get more time off for the summer. But but the main ones that we sort of consider like holidays are, are Christmas and Easter, obviously. Um, and those actually are the case in the Arab world, by the way. Like if you study in the Arab world or if you go and work in the Arab world, you will often get time off work for those as well as the Muslim celebrations as well. Because those are obviously um, Christian and pagan. But but in modern times, Christian celebrations, those are Christ- the Christmas and Easter so um so so what are the other ones right so you know so so we'll start we'll actually start with christmas maybe so so christmas the word christmas itself i, I don't think actually has well it probably has its origins in the word christ i, I imagine um but it's to do with the birth right and that, that's where the arabic word comes from so any celebration that comes around every year um in arabic you call an eid eid just about ayn ya dal eid and um yeah, so the, the 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 celebration of the birth, yeah, you say Eid al-Milad, Eid al-Milad, and it's important that you have the elephant and lamb at the beginning of al-Milad, yeah, Eid al-Milad, because it's the, the day of the birth, you know, if, if you're saying the birth, and people kind of know in Arabic that you're talking about the birth of Christ, yeah, the, the birth of Christ, alayhi salam, um, obviously we know that this, that's not actually the day he was born, but but it's the day when Christians celebrate his birth, right? So um so it's Eid al Milad. And the reason why I point that out is because if you just say Eid Milad, if you just say it's it's the Eid of a of any old Milad, right? It's not Christmas, it's not the birth of Christ that you're you're talking about. It's just anybody's birthday. Right? So like the word for Christmas is almost exactly the same as any old birthday, right? But um yeah, so if you're saying like Merry Christmas or if you're saying happy Christmas or whatever, you say you'd say Eid al Milad is Saeed. But if because so, then you've got the L's in there, because you're saying the birth, right? But if you're saying any old birth, right? You say Eid Milad Saeed without the L, right? Because it's just anybody else's birthday. But um, you know, a lot, a lot of Muslims actually don't celebrate birthdays, right? And it's not actually, it's not really even founded in the Muslim tradition, or 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 among any of the early generations, like um, among the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu or even among himself, it's not known of any of them celebrating birthdays, right? Like celebrating birthdays isn't something that comes from the islamic tradition which is why also like there's there's that often when you talk about the ages of people there'll be many different reports about the ages of different individuals who were around during the life of the prophet and even like when you study arabic arabic history and arabic literature and stuff like you'll always know people's date of death but never their date of birth like there are you know like there are so many like scholars and stuff that we know exactly when they died but we have no idea when they were born just and that, that that always seems strange to me, coming from like a Western background and then studying Arab history. But um, but that's just because birthdays just aren't really a big deal. Um, you know that they have become so, but that's more of an influence from the West um, rather than actually being something um, founded in Islam or actual original Arab tradition. So um, okay, so that's like that's a bit about birthdays and a bit about you know and 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 by extension, you know, to do with do with christmas obviously um easter is is also an eid it comes around every year but it's but it's eid al-fasah eid al-fasah 
I have also heard the term um, Eid al Qiyamah as well. I don't know if that's kind of like a more Coptic term because I've heard that in Egypt. And the Qiyamah literally means the resurrection, right? There's, it's used in Islamic tradition as well, the word Qiyamah. There's actually a surah of the Quran, surah 75, if I remember correctly, surah al Qiyamah. And uh, yeah, it means the resurrection, right? Which is um, which is what the Easter is, right? But um, but the term fasah is is used is used more commonly. Yeah, Eid al fasah is um is Easter, and it is widely celebrated in the Arab world as well. It's not it's not just a a feature of kind of Western Christianity. Um, speaking of birthdays, though, actually going back to that, there is you know th- again, there's different there's kind of different practices of this across the Arab and and Muslim countries as well, and there is actually like Eid al Nabawi. Eid al-Nabawi, and people often just refer to this as the Mawlid, yeah, and it means the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu so some countries really go in for it, right, like I know Morocco, for example, in Morocco a lot of people really, really go in for it, yeah, and really celebrate celebrate the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu um, I don't think it's even authentic that we even know exactly which day it was, as I said, like it's not in the Muslim or the Arab tradition to actually know birthdays, so I don't think there is actually consensus among the scholars of of even when of even when the Prophet Sallallahu was born, but there is a day that that the people who celebrate have kind of chosen. I I don't celebrate it as you'll probably get, probably gather from my language that I'm talking about it, but like, but like the people who do celebrate it seem quite certain of which day it's on. Um, so they have chosen a day, and some people do celebrate it, right? Or or and there are different degrees to which some people celebrate it. You know, some people some people just do things that are considered Islamically good on that day, and then other people actually do celebrate it. But that's um. You know, I've heard, I've heard of that be referred to as just al-Mawlid and then also Eid al-Nabawi. So like the, the Eid of the Nabi, yeah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah be pleased with him. Um, or, or peace and blessings be upon him rather. So those are kind of like, that's kind of a good segue actually into the into the Muslim celebrations. Because we've talked about Eid al-Milad and Eid of any old Milad. And uh, we also talked about Eid al-Fasah or Eid al-Qiyamah. And uh, yeah, and then Eid al-Nabawi. So um, we're coming into the Islamic ones now. So... So there are only two, actually in the actual Islamic tradition, there are only two Eids, right? And I, I believe there are even like explicit ahadith where the Prophet ﷺ talks about there only being two Eids. And um, and one of them is Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Fitr. And that's the one that's just been, the one that we've just had right after Ramadan. So the, the verb the verb fatara is used in other ways in the Quran, kind of means to, to open or to split something, I suppose. And it's actually where, um, I don't know if you've heard of like iftar, when people eat their iftar and they kind of open their fast, um, or they break their fast, they have breakfast, right? That also comes from the same root as fitr, right? So the Eid al-Fitr is when you kind of open your fasting, right? Like your fasting is finished. And that, that will always fall on the first of Shawwal. Um, Shawwal is the Islamic month after Ramadan, right? So the Sha'ban is the month before Ramadan, Ramadan, and then Shawwal. And um, yeah, Eid al-Fitr will always fall on uh, on the first of Shawwal. There's always a joke every year, like there's, all, like, <laughs> there's, all, there's always like people have like a large Muslim audience. Because we're all kind of anticipating when Eid is going to come, right? Like we're waiting for like the moon sighting. Um, however you do it, whether you do it from the observatory locally to you, or you go on the Saudi time. We're always waiting the day before when it could, like on the 29th of Ramadan, we're waiting to see if the moon is sighted. So we know that it's Eid the next day. And people will put out a post <laughs> to their Muslim audience and they're like, it has been confirmed that Eid will fall on. And then they're like, first of Shawwal. <laughs> so we still don't know. But that's, yeah, yeah. So, But anyway, it'll always be on the first of Shawwal. And um, yeah, but Islamic months are always are always 29, 29 days, or if the moon isn't sighted, it'll be thirty, but never more than thirty. Yeah, Islamic months are never more than thirty days. So that's uh, that's the one after Ramadan, right? Eid al-Fitr, and uh, the main thing with that is the food, right? Because you've been fasting for thirty days, and um, yeah, so Eid al-Fitr, the, the the main thing about it is the food, right? And um, and and the Eid Salah, of course, as well, right? Like early in the morning. I'm usually about 7 a.m. or whatever. You you go to the masjid for Eid Salah and there's um you know there's a salah you do lots of takbirat you say Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar. There's loads of there's loads of those and um and then afterwards there's like a short khutbah a little talk afterwards as well. Um I say like 7 a.m. like a big a big masjid like Regent's Park Mosque in London where I operate this year they'll do like seven they'll do like six of them they'll do one at 7 a.m. one at 8 a.m. one at 9 a.m. one at 10 a.m. one at 11 a.m. Um, because there's just so many people. You know, like even even the Muslims who who aren't that practicing. If 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 a Muslim is a sort of, is is a Muslim who goes once a year, they'll go on Eid, right? So you get a lot more people on Eid day than you would any other day. So um, okay, so that's Eid al-Fitr, right? 
Next is um, is Eid al Eid al Adha. Yeah, so Eid al Adha is um, falls on the tenth of the Hajj, and it's actually the and it's the last day of the Hajj period. That's that's the reason for it. So so that's the first reason why, right? It's it's at the end of the Hajj, um, and it's, it's sort of at the end of the Hajj process, right? When people go and do their Hajj, and um, and it's also in memory of um, uh, the Prophet Ibrahim, Prophet Abraham alayhi salam, his willingness to sacrifice his son, right? Because the Eid al-Adha, the Adha is to do with the sacrifice, right? The word Adha means the, the sacrifice. And, um, and just as Eid al-Fitr is about food, Eid al-Adha is as well, but specifically about the eating of the Adha, like specifically about eating of the sacrifice, right? Um, yeah, so um, yeah. So you, you, you'll usually, the, the person who is actually doing the slaughter, if you slaughter a goat or a sheep or whatever, um, then uh, you split the food up three ways. I think it's one for one for yourself and your family, one for your neighbours, and then one third of it goes to the poor. And um, yeah, and that's what you do with the meat. Um, here in this country, here in the UK, and mo- most of sort of most of the time outside of the Arab world or the Muslim world generally, like it's it's hard to do it yourself. Like most people sort of live in London. It's not that easy for them to just get hold of a goat and do their own slaughter. So you, so we normally send our money abroad, like us in our family. We usually send it to Somalia because we have connections and stuff out there, and my wife's from there and stuff. So anyway, okay. So those are like that's like a that's like a big intro, right? That's kind of the main celebrations that go on in the Arab world and and, and how to talk about them because because the celebrations of both are are definitely upheld, upheld, right? Like you know the Christian celebrations or the Western celebrations as they as they are probably more accurately Western celebrations and and the Muslim celebrations are both definitely upheld in. In, in every Muslim country I've ever been to, right? So, um, nice. So, so what about the language, right? So let, let's get into some good language terms. I have about 10 that I sort of thought would be worth talking about. So um, a really good one to know is the word atla. And atla is just a holiday, right? And you use the term atla, you can say like atla, atla saifiyya or al atla to saifiyya to, to mean like the summer holiday. And um, you use it for everything, right? Like you can even use it for the weekend, yeah, you can even say like the, the holiday of the weekend. Yeah, or كيف كانت العطلة? How, how was the holiday, right? And um, you use it for any time kind of you, you're off work or whatever. العطلة. And um, yeah, the plural of which is عطل. It's one of these words that's um, sometimes these words have a tamad bota on the end. They have a plural which doesn't. So like the word غرفتون, meaning a room, is plural as or um what else? Ni'matun, meaning a blessing. The plural of which is ni'am, ni'amun. And atla uh, is one like that. Atlatun, meaning a holiday. And then the plural of which is uh, is atal. Uh, next is the word a hafla. Haflatun. We had a haflatun here on uh, Yomul Ahad on Sunday. We had a we had a uh, we had a hafla. It was actually it was actually my son's birthday lined up exactly with the day we were going to have our our hafla to Eid. We we're going to have like our Eid party. Um, yeah, I managed to appease everyone that day because we we don't celebrate birthdays in our family, but um, but my mum does, and obviously all my family who are non-Muslims they celebrate birthdays and they want to buy presents and stuff for, for my little boy, and um, so so those two landed on the same day, so everyone was happy, alhamdulillah. But uh, yeah, hafla, uh, hafla is a party of any kind, right? It has the term hafla has no religious significance to it at all, right? A haflatun can be used for any kind of party, and from that same word, right? From the word haflatun. If we look at its root letters, ha, fa, and lam, but we have a verb, ihtafala, meaning to celebrate something. You say, nahtafilu, kada wa kada, something and something, right? Nahtafilu, we celebrate, or, or, um, ihtafalna, we celebrated, blah, 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 yeah? And then, kind of, the, the word for a celebration is an ihtifal, right? That's, that's the mustar, or the root word, rather, of, um, of the verb, ihtafala, yeah? And ihtifal is a, a celebration, because not all, not not every ihtifal is a hafla. Yeah, not every celebration is actually a party as such. Like a party will have musiqa, will have music um, a, a lot of the time. Unless you're of the opinion that music's not permissible like we are. But usually a, a hafla has the connotations of like balloons and, and musiqa and, and raqs dancing and stuff. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, so an ihtifal, just like in English, we have a different word for a hafla, a, a party, and then ihtifal, which is a celebration. Um, yeah, and then obviously I kind of, one of the other words I wanted to mention was the verb raqasa, meaning to, meaning to dance, yeah? So raqasa, and then the noun of which is arraqs, you know, if you would say something like, I love um, Spanish dancing or something, yeah? Or hibbu al-raqs al-ispani, or something like that, yeah? 
Um, yeah, so al raqs the verb al raqasa, and then in the present tense, yarqusu, it's a qusu one, yarqusu. And I arqusu kathiran, I dance a lot. Yeah, it's, that's not true actually, I'm not a good dancer, but um, but yeah, just as an example. Yeah, the verb al raqasa, yarqusu. Um, should we do some foods now? Um, I haven't actually written any down, but I would. Uh, let me do the last ones that I've got written down actually, and we'll we'll talk about those. And then we'll maybe get into some foods afterwards. And if there are any foods that I miss that you guys have a lot, then you can just DM me on Instagram, or you can email me or Facebook me or whatever, and I'll, uh, I'll I'll help you guys out. So um, the next one was the verb to invite. Um, invitations are very important. Yeah, if you get invited to something, you should go, unless you've got a very good excuse. Yeah, it's among. You know, it's a, it's among the five rights that a Muslim has over another Muslim, is um ijaba to da'wa is a you know ab- obliging the invitation yeah that you accept the invitation if you're invited somewhere, so um yeah if you're invited to someone's house or to someone's party to someone's hafla or their ihtifal then um then you should go, so the the verb to invite someone is da'a yeah and then but but the present tense is yadru, um yeah so it is one of these kind of final week verbs da'a yadru. And um, and when we hear it in the in the past tense, when we conjugate it, that elif becomes a well. So you say like da'utu, and a da'utuhu. I, I I invited him. Da'utu her. I invited her. And a da'utuhum. I, I invited them. Yeah. A da'utuhum li haflati. I invited them to my party. Right. Da'utu. I, I invited. And um, you know, although you know, in certain contexts, it does have like a religious significance because the noun from it, as some of you some of you probably know, is the word da'wa. And the word da'wa is even is even well known among the right the right wing in this country as well actually. To da'wa means an invitation, right? A da'wa is an invitation, and you use it even for secular things like a wedding or whatever, right? Like if if your weddings are secular, but like it has a connotation even in English now of being just like preaching. Um, yeah, but it, it doesn't mean that. It just means an invitation, right? Like when you do da'wa, it means that you are inviting people, but it often has the connotation of inviting people to Islam. Right, it's not always the case. It might you might just be inviting them to your hafla, but um, but yeah, the term dawa in and of itself has a tap on the on the end. Um, yeah, it's not dawa with an with an elif on the end of any kind. It's um dawa ton is an invitation. Yeah, it's the verb to invite, and then presents. Oh, that's a good one actually. Hadiya ton a hadiya is a a present. Hadiya ton and the plural, um, hadaya probably, um, hadaya with two elifs in there. Hadaya. Um, is presents. Yeah, أعطيتك هدايا كثيرة or something. I I gave you many presents. Um, yeah, because there's there's almost always presents at the ihtifal, especially for the children. Um, yeah, or or, or on Eid you usually get you give kids money. Kids almost always get money. It's usually a big payday for kids on Eid day. Sweets, they get sweets and money. It's usually yeah, as I say, big payday. I remember in the first year when I embraced Islam. It seemed like a lot of the families who I saw treated me like I was one of the kids and they gave me money as well. So it was a big payday. Unfortunately, it only lasted one year. After that, they were like, you're a grown man now. You don't get any money anymore. Somalis call it haqqul eid. They call it haqqul eid. It means when they get money. It's from Arabic, actually. A haqq means your right. And then al eid is of eid, right? So kids are like, it's my right on eid. Haqqul eid. Yeah, do you give, give me the money. Yeah, so, so Somalis say that. I've, ne- I've never heard Arabs say, it, even though it's even though they're entirely Arabic words. Yeah, haqul eid. But um, yeah, but Somalis say it anyway. So let let's do some foods now. Um, I don't know how many words. Are, I don't know how many. We're, we've probably done what ten, ten useful words or something. But let let's do some food, as well actually. So, um, cake, cake. It, it's not just a Western thing having cakes at parties. Um, you know, usually on at Eid parties and stuff, you'll have cakes and a a cake is. It actually, I think it actually is in Fusha, a ka'aka. Ka'aka is actually a, a cake in, in Fusha as well. You can use it in standard Arabic. But, um, yeah, the, the reason why I questioned it is because in, in Palestine they always say ka'ake. Ka'ake. Um, with, and it was the Palestinian dialect of Arabic. They always pronounce the te'mad as an e. So, um, yeah, you wouldn't say ghurfatun like like we do in Fusha. You'd say like ghurfe, or instead of... Um, um, Kanafatun for this sweets that they have. Um, they say iknafe. Whenever there's a tamad bolt on the end, it will always become an e sound. That's kind of a characteristic, a character, a a a characteristic of um yeah of like the Shami Levantine dialect. Um, but anyway, yeah. So kaka kaka is a is a cake of whatever kind. Yeah, kaka chocolate, kaka 
faraula, if you have a strawberry cake or something, or um, whatever other kind of cake, right? I, I don't bake many cakes, so I don't know other kind of cakes. But then, then kanefe, or iknefe, if you're in Palestine, iknefe neblusi, if you have neblusi, um, kanefe is another one that you'll have in, in, in the Arab world and stuff too. And then, um, you know, mashrubat, drinks of whatever kind, um, they almost always have the same words as English, but you just kind of like, you just kind of Arabize them a little bit. So like Coke would just be like a cooler or Coca Cola or um, you know, whatever, well, well, whatever else they are. You just kind of Arabize the names a little bit more. That's that's a really strange thing about some foods in the Arab world. Like like in McDonald's, this is a slight tangent, but like like if you go to McDonald's in Egypt, the experience is almost entirely in English, right? Like all the names, you're like, you know, you go, you go into, you go in there and in your Egyptian dialect you've been practicing all day. You're like, and I is... And I is a Big Mac chicken. You can have a chicken Big Mac in, in Egypt, by the way. You can't have that. We don't get those in the UK. Um, but yeah, you can have a Big Mac chicken. But you still say like your Egyptian bits in the middle. You're like an I is to say I want. An I is milkshake a strawberry. Or, or Big Mac chicken. And yeah, that's that, <laughs> that's actually how they talk. And you get you get your your Big Mac box and everything, and it's got Arab. It's got like the Arabic Big Mac. McChicken nuggets and McFlurry. That's, yeah, so so that's an experience. Cool. Okay, I, I I can't think of any other foods that we that 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 we should talk about really. So maybe I'll leave that up to you guys. So, um, so yeah, thank you very much for tuning into this episode of the podcast. It's really really nice to be back. I'm gonna be recording a load more now. I'm gonna tell you what other episodes we've got coming up actually whilst we're here. So, um, I am doing in the next episode we're gonna do a, a lesson on leveling up your sentences. Um, it would be nice to kind of learn some other verbs, like just, just to just to expand the beginner's ability to express themselves. So rather than just to say things like "I like" or or "I want," to say "I want to blah blah blah" or "I hope to do blah blah blah" or "I should" or "I need to" or "I have to," um, you know, or or whatever, right? So um, so we're going to be talking about that a little bit more. We're just gonna, the next episode, episode thirty-five, will just be a lesson to up-level our sentences a little bit in Arabic. So that'll be episode thirty-five. Um, after that, I'm doing one on the GCSE. It's a little bit late um, for some of you sitting the GCSE, but for any of you considering it in the future, because um, you need to start thinking about it soon if you want to sit sit in next year anyway. So I'm going to do an episode on the GCSE. And also, I've been in a few heated discussions with people about the GCSE recently because I've made my opinion quite clear in the past about my opinions on the GCSE um, that are not very positive. Um, I've actually... And I've had some involvement with them. It's not entirely without any knowledge. Like, I've... I, you know, I've I've been an examiner for them. I've conducted oral exams for the GCSE and stuff before, and um, and I think that the lot of them are a bunch of they're a joke, really. I don't think they care about their students, um, and I think that so long as you're chucking your money at them, I don't think that they're really gonna make any change at all, and they don't really care if you get the support that you need or not. And that's why my inbox is full of abandoned teachers and students who the exam board have not bothered to look after. But anyway, we're going to go into the details about the GCSE exam, what it is really good for, um, how it will really help you, and just some stuff about the structure of it and things like that that, I, that I'd like to talk about as well, because um, I'd, I'd like to give an, a give a balanced um, representation of the GCSE exam, because it is good for people to have like a, a clear exam to work towards and stuff, and it is good to have a recognised qualification. Well, I don't know if that's even important, really, in languages, but... But anyway, there are lots of good things that we can say about it anyway. So, so I'm going to do a whole episode on the GCSE. Um, some, you know, because because there are some really common questions that I get about the GCSE that I really like to answer kind of publicly. Uh, next, we are going to do for episode 37. Um, oh, we're talking about the four learning styles. Um, a lot of students have asked me about like, or oh, if I'm a more kind of aud- auditory learner, like I'm sure a lot of you guys are listening to the podcast. If I'm a more auditory learner, how do I incorporate that? into my Arabic studies, or if I'm more of a kinesthetic learner, how do I incorporate that into my studies? Or if I'm more of a visual learner, how do I incorporate that? So um, we're going to go into that, um, because that's kind of my thing, actually. Um, I started out kind of my languages teaching career, um, teaching creative ways of learning languages. That was kind of my my first thing. I used to work for a company called Roots into Languages. And um, yeah, I contributed to this workshop that we we created um, 
yeah called like language learning techniques for students with learning difficulties or something like that because i because I, I i'm i suffer with dyslexia and um, there are lots of things that i kind of learn how to do and how to kind of hack my brain to get good language learning results so we're going to do that anyway in episode 37 and then episode 38 we're doing the kinds of well because a few students have said to me well what's the difference between you know well qasam and then well just meaning and and stuff like that how do we know when, if we say Wallah, how do we know if we're saying by Allah or and Allah? How do we know the difference? And I've deliberately left out the case ending on the Allah um, so that I can explain that in that lesson. So that's the next five that we've got coming up. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys are looking forward to that as much as I am. And uh, they'll be coming out every single Monday for the next five weeks. Um, keep on suggesting suggesting ideas for episodes of the podcast. Um, because I am kind of making notes now for the next kind of five weeks after that for different topics I'm going to be covering. And uh, that is it for this episode of the podcast. Thank you very much, guys, for lending me your ear. It truly means the world to me that you guys lend me your ear and you listen to the stuff that I'm putting out there. And more and most importantly, that you guys are actually making meaningful steps towards learning the Arabic language. And that is absolutely amazing that you choose to do that. So catch you guys in the next episode of the podcast. Don't forget to check out the YouTube channel this week as well, because this Wednesday we're doing the book corner. First, ep- first ever episode of the book corner. That's the next thing I'll be putting out, actually. So if you guys want to keep in touch with that, come over to my YouTube channel on Wednesday and we will be doing a review of this um, Chambers, Chambers. Probably chambers, probably not chambers unless we're in France. Um, Arabic vocabulary. We've got a little book here that I'm doing a little review of, talking about how you can use it in your studies, how much it costs, where you can get it. So that's what we're going to be doing every Wednesday, little book reviews. That's what we're doing for the next five weeks anyway. So every single one of you be on the YouTube channel, Arabic Time YouTube channel, at 5 p.m. on Wednesday for the next video that I'm putting out. See you guys then. Have a really awesome next couple of days. Until I see you the next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace. The Arabic in 60 Steps program is a step-by-step online Arabic course, which takes you right from learning your very first few words in the Arabic language and putting them together to make simple sentences, right the way up to knowing over a thousand Arabic words and being able to access texts like the Quran, Hadith literature, and even Arabic poetry. The minute you join, you have immediate access to the video course and up over a hundred bonus resources. I'll put your premium printed and bound workbook in the post for you, first class that very same day. Wherever you live in the world, we'll get one out to you at no extra cost whatsoever. And you'll also get six months of one-to-one mentorship from one of our graduate level mentors. You know, just to give you some of the names of the mentors that we have. First, we have our brother Mohammed, who's actually been a guest on the podcast. He's actually a graduate himself of the Arabic in 60 Steps program. So he knows it like the back of his hand. But we also have our brother Ismail Beaumont, who's the founder and the creator of Mesor Arabic. It's an enormous privilege to have him as one of the mentors on the program. And then for the sisters, we have our sister Maymoon, who's actually from Singapore originally, but spent a number of years studying in Syria. She has a very, very high level Arabic graduate, mashallah. So the course is an investment. You know, we need to tell you it is an investment. It needs to be so that we know the students that we're getting are serious. And you know that the teachers and the instruction that you're getting is serious and we're going to get the job done. So although students normally have to pay thousands of pounds to get this volume of resources and support and to have it so flexible and such high quality provided for them, we actually only charge £497. And that's for lifetime access, by the way. And what's even better is that we do actually have a few different payment plans available to help students spread the cost if needs be. I mean, look, come on. Thousands of people out there are spending way over £50 a month on coffee and takeaways. Using that money for a few months to learn Arabic instead is a seriously good deal. To find out more, to have a personal phone call with me for half an hour to see if it's a good fit for you and to see how we can get you on the program, just go to www.arabicin60steps.com. Hope to hear from you guys soon.